lot of you should have heard of Nick and um, maybe look, uh, have, have seen his materials. It is very famous in um, materials development and instructional design. So he is the director of pedagogy at PT Publications, an independent digital publishing company that specializes in the design of digital learning materials. He also has been working um, in the education field since 19, uh, 1990s. And uh, he has over 20 years of experience uh, working with online and branded learning environment. He also has been uh, training teachers and developing innovative products around the world. And he got twice, in fact, he won the British Council Innovations Award uh, twice. And um, he has done a lot of projects, including two years as pedagogical manager for an online school owned by Melina ELT. And in fact, I just had a look at that the other day. And uh, he has a number of uh, publications. So you could actually check out his website, which we also put in his bio on our website. So now let's welcome Nick. Um, to share with us his experience and uh, we will have a very interactive session with you. So if you have any questions, please put in the chat. We will also have at the end the Q&A time. All right, so now let's hand over the time to Nick. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and good afternoon. Um, hopefully uh, I can I'll start sharing my screen in just a minute. And, uh, I'll get that. Share. Okay. And hi, folks. So hopefully you can see my screen now. It should say adapting materials for the remote classroom. Great. That's good to know. Okay. I just I just need to arrange things a little so I can make sure I can find the chat when it comes up. There's, where's the chat? There it is. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. I'll make a start. My chat box has now decided to shrink. That's better. Okay. Good afternoon. And uh, um, just before I start, um, I'll the the presentation will co contain quite a few different links to different websites and resources. Don't worry about trying to make notes of them. I'll give you one link at the end which contains the presentation as you're watching it and it will be completely interactive and you'll be able to go through that again and click through all the links. So sort of don't worry too much about the actual links themselves. Okay, so I'll just start. Um, I don't need to go into this very much. I've already had an introduction, but, but um, basically this is a little bit of information about myself. I have sort of four different roles that I do, my four different jobs. Um, as most of us as teachers know what that's like, um, having multiple jobs to make a living. I'm director of pedagogy yeah, for PG Publications, but I also do quite a lot of work in course design and have designed courses for Eton College, for the British Council, Bell Educational Services and organisations like that. I'm also a sort of a course course book and and content author and of of, of one my first my second innovation award for a book that I designed myself called uh, digital video. And as well as that, I do some training work and consultancy work as well, and I share quite a lot of things online uh, through social media. So if when you get the presentation, you want to see what I share online, by all means, go through these links to the social media kind of channels at the bottom of the presentation. And you can check out the different things that I do online and, and the things that I share and curate. Okay, so that's enough about me. That's, uh, well, there'll be a little bit more about me. Um, just a bit of uh, what we're going to look at today. Um, I want to go through a bit of the background or sort of the, some of the experience that I've had with um, developing online courses, blended learning courses, blending between remote, physical, face-to-face, -face, um, those kind of things. I'd like to sort of look at some of the challenges. Um, I was given some of your materials to look at and go through um, to sort of look at how that would translate into the remote classroom. So I'd like to look at some of the challenges that I identified there. 
and then I'll go through some example materials um, of some things that I've built myself, some things that I've adapted from your materials, and then we'll look at some of the tools that I've used to do that. And at the end, we can have a Q&A and you can ask me any other questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, so just in terms of uh, background, and the, where I'm coming from and the, the kinds of things that I've done. I've actually been involved, uh, as, as, as you said, for just over 20 years in online education. And I, I first started my first blended learning teaching. Um, it was uh, this, in 1998, that was at the end of the last century, which makes me feel very old now. Um, but uh, the, the first course that I taught on was students went to the web, to a website, downloaded interactive materials, which they did offline on their computer, and then they would have a telephone call with me as their tutor, and I would talk through the materials with them, you know, and that sort of moved on to sort of um, more sort of online and blended learning, and I, I, I sort of started using a virtual environment called NiceNet in about 2020. Um, just at the turn of the century, which was just text and was really useful and started learning a lot from that. Since then, I've done various things. I've taught in a 100% in online school. Um, that was with 70 teachers teaching remotely from different parts of the world. And that was focused on students in Brazil. So, you know, our students in Brazil would get their pick their teacher, they could pick any of these 70 teachers from anywhere in the world, and they would have their lessons in an environment like this in, in something similar to Zoom with sort of a, an online learning course that they could work through too. I've also worked for universities adapting courses. I worked with uh, King's College Online adapting their uh, master's, master's in uh, financial law course uh, a couple of years ago. I've worked with Eton College building soft skills courses for teenagers as well. And sort of, um, what I've found is sort of a lot of the challenges that we come across in doing that are quite common, especially when we're, we're working from what was originally a paper-based syllabus for delivery in a physical classroom to take going to an online environment and those kinds of challenges. So let's have a, a look at some of the challenges. Okay, so one, one of the first things is, especially when looking at your materials, where, what I was thinking about was the length of lessons. And, and that can be quite challenging. You know, with, with sort of university level students having a, a lesson that's one or two hours long in, in a physical classroom isn't that much of a challenge. But when it's an interactive lesson that's in a remote classroom like this, it becomes much more challenging. And sort of pushing lessons anything over over an hour can start to become very uncomfortable for students and for teachers you know they need a break and they need some socialization in between so that's one of the challenges is sort of breaking those lessons down into smaller chunks um, a lot of especially at the university level a lot of um, a lot of content is based around text and often quite long texts and making these screen reader suitable can be very difficult you know especially if you're doing them in the <coughs> excuse me in the remote classroom and you're getting students to read in the remote classroom you know how do we share those texts with students how do we get give them time to read and get them interacting you know maybe those are some of the things that we should start taking offline online but out of the remote classroom you know, there's a, there are problems with, you know, suitability and screen fit. You know, most of the materials that I looked at have been designed for the kind of portrait kind of A4. And now we need to convert them into sort of horizontal and, and sort of more of a presentation mode. So, you know, there's a, adapting those issues. There are also sort of issues of copyright that I noticed in some, you know, whereas it's fine to give someone a Word document uh, with a link to a YouTube video, you know, if you start, you know, grabbing that video or downloading it, then it start and or, or sort of using it in, in online materials, then you have to sort of, um, you know, some of those copyright issues become very different. Um, there's also what I saw quite frequently was collaborative writing activities and again there are challenges to do that doing that in this kind of environment there are also solutions 
also mater the materials by their nature are quite dense and it's quite dense information that you have a, a kind of university students level and so sort of making that accessible in a, on a screen can be quite difficult as we know you know reading from a screen is more difficult um, class I don't know how big your class size is what's the average size of a class could you type that into chat 20 yes 20 well, yeah, I'm seeing sort of 20 to 30, and that can be quite difficult to deal with in this kind of environment. You know, if you're setting up breakout rooms, which you need to do for, for student to student interaction, um, then, you know, you want students in groups of four. If you've got 20 to 30 students, you've got five, six, seven breakout rooms. And in order to monitor what's happening in those breakout rooms you have to go to each one individually to listen in and that can be quite difficult so you know dealing with those class sizes can be quite challenging and thinking about how you do that you know requires some thought also uh, you know i saw quite a lot of split reading and split listening activities as well which is you know presents um, challenges here as well they're not challenges that can't be overcome they're interesting challenges but it, it can be still quite challenging how do you do a split listening activity you know in this kind of environment and I'll, I'll have a look at some of the ways that I've looked at solving that problem and lastly you know I think there's this big issue at the bottom of, about asynchronous and synchronous learning you know when I was looking through the materials there's a lot of material there it's a lot to get through in the time you know can some of that be done asynchronously by putting on onto a learning environment you know I believe you use canvas don't you rather than blackboard or moodle I, I saw canvas mentioned in the materials you know so sort of looking at that and how we can sort of build much more interactive materials for canvas is quite interesting so those are some of the challenges that i've been sort of looking at moodle as well yeah great blackboard canvas moodle great good you know, and I think, you know, there are there are important decisions that we need to make before we sort of decide where we put our material and whether we convert it to the remote classroom or whether we put it on one of those platforms for students to do more autonomously or socially. And I think, you know, one of the key things that we're, we're thinking about first is can the computer evaluate it? You know, in the case of things that have a correct answer, especially if it's a single correct answer, you know, that you're working with on with students, then my answer would be yes, the students can, the, the computer can evaluate it. And that would be a good reason for putting it onto the computer. So, for example, if you've got a, a reading comprehension activity, and the answers are, you know what answers you want from the students and you can put those into the computer program, then that's a good thing to, for students to do online asynchronously because you can configure the feedback so that it tells them whether they're right, whether they're wrong and why. So that would be a good reason for, for doing something in the asynchronous online rather than a virtual remote classroom. No. So is can the computer evaluate it? Is there a correct answer, a single correct answer? The other thing to think about is what's the value in the student to student interaction that the task, task generates? You know, if you're doing really meaningful tasks with students and getting them to, to knock their heads together and think about things together, then that's great. That's the kind of thing that really needs to be done in the remote classroom. Or potentially you could do it asynchronously on a forum in something like Moodle like that where they, they get ch a chance to think and a chance to bash their ideas together and we're not really looking for a clearly defined right answer and you know the other thing ab about that then becomes what's the value in the interaction happening synchronously so if it's something that could be done in that Moodle forum and they could discuss it effectively, exchange ideas around it, maybe it's better to do it there than in, in the remote classroom. 
if it's if it really involves developing speaking skills and using language creatively then i think it's much more important that it comes as part of the remote classroom because that's the only place that we can do that outside of physically meeting together so i think that those those are some of the sort of things that i look at and think about when i'm sort of breaking down into materials into where it's the best place to deliver it Okay, so let's have a look at some examples and I'll go through uh, quite a few. The first ones are things that I've developed from your own materials and then I'll show you some things that I've done and, and I'll mix this in with looking at the kinds of tools that I use to do that. I'll start with, with, with a tool actually, and it's the tool that I use to create this presentation. And as you can see, it's quite dynamic it's movable um, and the, the other great thing about the presentation and, and the tool that I've used to create it is these presentations will run on any device so they should run on any device with a browser so students can run them on their mobile device on their phone so you can pass them links for that or they can run them on a tablet or they can run them on their laptop and they're very easy to share here. And this is the tool that I've used to create this presentation. It's a tool called Genially, and it's very adaptable. You can create lots of different sorts of materials with it. As you can see, I've got lots of different folders of materials at the top here, uh, where I have my different materials. And these are ones that I'm working on at the moment. Um, if I want to create something new, I click here and there's lots of different things that I can create, choose from to create. There are some sort of ready-made templates there. Some of them are learning experiences. Some of them are infographics. Um, there are presentation um, templates and different sort of video types of te presentation templates. So lots of different things that you can create. And there's also an interesting inspiration board. So you can look at examples of what other te teachers have created for this environment. You know, and uh, you can click through those to see how they work. So if you want to see examples of how other people have used this for their materials, then it's good to, to look in the inspiration part. You can register on this site and sign up for a free account and start looking around it. And, uh, and um, you don't have to, to pay. And, and you can create some quite effective things without having it with a free account. So there are lots of different things that you can look at and find out what it does and lots of infographics. If I go back to one of my creations, when you come to making something, <coughs> excuse me. Um, let's have a look at this one. I'm just going to click on edit there. And as you can see, it's a little like PowerPoint. You've got lots of different slides down the side here. And you build the different slides of your deck. If you want to edit a slide, let's just get rid of that. But you use the menu along the far left here. And there are lots of different things that you can do. You can add different texts to it and different text formats. And then just edit the text that you want. And it's very good in terms of images. If you want to add images, there's, there are royalty free image banks in there and having those images can make the, the materials look that much more, more um, attractive. Um, one of the things that I looked at was a, a thing about locust or locusts. So if you want a quick picture of a, a locust, you can drag one onto your presentation and resize it however you want to. You can also animate that so that it zooms in, or it focus, fades in, slides in. So you can animate that object however you want it to be. Let's get it to zoom. And you can also add links to it. So you can link it to external resources. So if you wanted to link it to a video about locusts or a web page about locusts, students could then click on it and go to that um, page. Or you can just add 
tooltips like that. And when you're ready to, to, to view it, you click on the dark eye. And as you see, and as I mouse over it, it says it brings up my text. Okay, so that's, you, know, you can add different other kinds of resources to it. There are lots of icons or charts that you can edit with your own information. Um, and it also has lots of different interactive elements you know, that you can then animate and add links to. It could be bus times, maps, and those sort of things. The other really useful thing that you can do here is that you can add audio, video, or embed codes to it. So you can either record your own video or an add audio or an add an audio. Or if you want to add a video, you can add something from Vimeo or YouTube or other things that you can add to it. You can add links from YouTube. You can add Google Docs and uh, Google Spreadsheets and things like that. Or you can just copy it in, in an embed code here. So it will embed any interactive element into the screen. So lots of useful things that and useful things that you can do with Genially. And that's what I build all of the basic uh, remote classroom presentations from. I'll, I'll show you some examples of ones that I've built already. Here's the first one. This is this is based around your book report activity. And you know, it's a simple, I'm just dragging my toolbars around, they're always getting in the way. Uh, simple activity. And uh, so the first sheet of the activity, you've just shown the task. It's got an image here to make it a little bit more attractive. And if I click on the info button, it opens the template that my students need to write into. So it's pulled all those different activities onto one screen. And by adding these, inter these kind of interactive buttons, it makes additional materials much more accessible. No. So I could add a, a video into that screen or I could add a link to something else. And that's, you know, just a simple way to adapt that. You know, when I go to the next page of it, there was some uh, there was quite a long text and students needed to um, to uh, uh, um, look at read the different texts and think of headings for it. And what I do with a lot of my materials, if I, if I want to break up reading activities and I want students to do those in breakout rooms, is to give them these QR codes. So for example, now with their phone and the QR, they can, you can get each student to scan a different QR code and then they can open the text that they need onto their phone. And as you can see here is, my, is the first part of the text about the locust. And uh, I can scroll up and down that quite easily. And then when I want the next part, I just scan the next QR code. The question also referenced back to the questions that I asked here. So I've put those in here. So they're still accessible for students. Okay, so if I just, I'll see if I can grab the links to those. I created those, those additional links using a tool called H5P, which is a free plugin for um, Moodle, Blackboard, and um, I'll pass you the link. So what I can do is, as well, instead of using the QR codes or as well as using the QR codes, is pass students links to each part of the site. And those have put, been put into H5P. So I can either get students to scan the materials onto their phone, then go out and into the breakout rooms and discuss it together. Or, you know, I can give them links to it so they can discuss it together. The other possibility is I can build something like more like this. And this has the different sections of the text in, and they, they can just click to open different sections. And this helps me deal with the problem of screen fit. So this is a, something called an accordion and it adapts texts so that you can put break them down into paragraphs so that students can easily see the different paragraphs. And again, the students can scan that onto the phone if they want to, and they can still work with that on their phone. Do you, do you, how many of you use QR scan, code scanners? Do your students have QR code scanners? Can you type any yes or no into the chat? Yeah. 
yeah, I think QR, co QR codes are a really useful way to get, get materials onto students' phones or onto their tablets, and to sort of, especially when we're using breakout rooms, because what we find is when students go into the breakout room, our screen that we're sharing becomes invisible. So, you know, they have no materials. They're, they're all of a sudden, they don't know what to do in the breakout room. They've forgotten what the text was or forgotten what the task was. So if we put those on to, online and put them into a QR code, they can scan that onto their phone so that when they break it, go into their breakout rooms, they've got everything to reference on their phone. And that can make that process a lot easier. And so that accordion as well helps to break down the text and separating the text into, into separate parts and putting QR codes up there helps as well. One of the other things I noticed that was that the, you know, there was a video that you used. And again, you know, this is um, something that's, that Genially is very good for because we can embed videos into the Genially presentation without breaking copyright. So, for example, this video is still on its original site on YouTube. We haven't taken it away, but I've embedded it into my presentation and I can just play it from here. So now the presentation works from the presentation, I just muted the sound, the presentation works from within, you know, the video works from within the presentation and I've got all the questions here that my students need to think about as well. And that's quite easy to do. As an alternative, I've also get, got a QR code up here and there's a different version that I've done, that I've created to make it more interactive. I just pause that. So often one of the problems with using videos, especially if you're getting students to look at them at home before the lesson, is that they're kind of, they, become passive, um, they become a passive audience and you don't really know how much they've engaged with it. Using a tool called H5P, you can build video activities that are that much more interactive. Okay, and this is an example of the same video, but this time I've used H5P to build in interactions over the top of it. I'm just going to mute it so that I can talk. If you see these little dots along the, the play line, each of these is an interaction that I've built onto the, onto the video. And when it gets to that dot, it will pause and it will give them something to check that they're following it. So if we get to one in just a minute... Okay, when it gets to the dot, I said optimistically, yeah, it's stopped and you've got check number one. So students click on that and it's got a little true, true false comprehension check to make sure that they've been following what they've done. If they click it, they can check that they've got the answer right, then they can continue. Okay, they get a little bit further along. And another one, check number two appears. This time they've got to fill in some mi missing words. Again, they can check and continue. So using this tool within H5P, you can build in um, different interactions to, to make sure students are engaged. And H5P is a plugin for Moodle, for Canvas, uh, for Blackboard. So it can be used with those, those um, platforms and it will track your, your students' results. So, you know, if your students are doing this on an online course or they're doing it at home, you can still track what they've done and that they've got the answer, whether they've got the answers right. So if I got one wrong, I can try again. If I've still got it wrong, I can retry and then continue. It can be also be, be configured so that if students are getting the answers wrong, it will send them back and they will have to do those at that, watch that part of the video again. So, and there are all sorts of different types of activ activities and interactions that you can overlay on this. See that one I've got wrong, right. And then at the end, I've built in a summary activity. So they summarize what they've learned from the activity. 
And at the very end, if we wait just a moment, it stops and there's a link to find out more. So it takes students to the article that's being discussed in this activity and that links out. So again, you're not breaking copyright. That's a, just a link outside of the site. And that's, that's using a tool called H5P, which I use to build a lot of the interactions for the materials that I use. This is what H5P looks like. And as I said, it's a plugin um, for Moodle, for Canvas, for WordPress, and it can be used to build activities that work within the LMS on all of those sites and track learning. I'll give you a link to it and, and share this because it has lots of different activity types way beyond the one that, one that I've just shown you. And I'll show you some more. So there's a link to h5p.org. And here you can see all the different interactivity types that it can do. You can have dialogue cards, dictation, audio recording, filling in blanks, um, matching activities, all different kinds of activities that are very useful for, for English language learning and for content checking. They can build timelines with different um, kinds of information on. So this is a timeline about berries and there's different ways of presenting information. And again, these different ways of presenting information can break down quite dense information and make it much more screen friendly for students and much more accessible for them if they're doing it online. You know, so those are some really useful, it's a really useful tool set. And that's what I build most of the interactions within my own materials for with. I'll show you a few more examples. Um, this is something else, actually, this isn't from H5P. Um, one thing that I looked at were, that I noticed that you were doing quite a lot was um, trying to, to get students to work on text interactively. And this is a way of doing that. It's a tool called Crypt, CryptPad. Oh, sorry, I've got the wrong one. Let's go to the tool. I've lost, oh, I need my link for that. So CryptPad enables students to do collaborative writing. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demonstrate that with you now. I've got a text that you're supposed to improve and I'll share the link to you. As you can see, there's a link coming through there now. So I'm got, gonna copy the link. You've got editing rights to it. So I, I've pasted it into chat. So if you click on that link on the bottom of chat, you will see that we can all go into this document and work on it collaboratively together. So if you, if you click the, on the link and then, start, and then click on the text, you can start to alter it. Start having a go and taking a few different words out. Okay, I can see you joining down this side on the left. And I can see, see people starting to edit the text now and move it around. So if we have a link like this that we give to students, we can get them working in breakout rooms together and, and peer editing and editing and creating text together and doing text editing activities. I can, if, if you go back to my presentation, you'll see that I've, I've also embedded the, 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 the sheet into my presentation so I can see what my students are doing within my presentation as well, you know, which is an interesting, uh, Way to look at things. So I can see how they're working on that together. And, and that's a, a very easy thing to create. It's just, you know, I just copy the, and paste the text into CryptPad. It's a little like Google Documents, but very quick and easy to use. And, um, and then it's ready to go. So if you look at the presentation now, this is what CryptPad looks like. Um, if I open the link, I click on rich text. And it gives me this kind of shareable notepad here. I can just copy and paste whatever te text I want. And then when I click on share, I can give my students rights to either just view it or rights to edit it. And then I just copy the link and share it. And there's the link. 
Uh, there's a question about students being able to access these in China. Um, with H5P, that shouldn't be a problem. It sits on whatever um, uh, LMS you're using. So if your LMS can be viewed in China, then the H5P activities can be. Um, with Genially, that isn't a problem. And I, I'm, but I'm not sure about this one. You'd have to check it to find out. Uh, I know that Google Docs is blocked there, but this works on a different system. So this might well be um, still be usable. Nick, there is also another question about how is it different or better to a Google Doc? Um, if it's accessible in China and Google Docs isn't, that would be one example of why it's better. Um, it's very, sim it's very sim similar to Google Docs. The reasons why it might be, you might use this instead is because it's very quick to set up and very accessible. So, you know, if you just suddenly realize you want to do this writing activity and you've got 10 minutes, you can create a pad and share it with students within minutes. Whereas with Google Docs, you have to be very careful that you set up all the sharing correctly and that your students have the links and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's a way of, of, you know, using something like Google Docs without students having to log in, without them having to have an account, without them having to go through that whole validation process. So it's very quick. It also has a, there's also a couple of other tools available on CryptPad as well. If we go back, they can also set up, create their own polls on it, work on presentations. There's a Kanban board for planning together and, they, and even a whiteboard as well. If they want to do whiteboard work together, they can open a collaborative whiteboard and work on, on drawing things together or sketching things out. So it has a lot of additional features as well. So again, and it's free to use, it's, it's open source and um, you can store documents on there too and very quick and easy to access. So that was what I created that one in for. I had another, a look at another one of your materials, which it was, it was a, a talk about happiness and it was based on some material from NPR radio and it, students had to get into groups and listen to different audio files and then sort of compare what they'd listened to. And I've done a similar thing like this in my own materials. So, and what I've done with these is I've added a, a QR code, I've added the audios and a QR code for each one. So students can use the QR code to scan the audio file onto their mobile phone so that they can listen to it and when they break, go into the breakout rooms, they can still listen and refer to it. So that's one easy way to uh, do that. Another way is that I've put the audios also underneath. So the audios, so the audio files are all also underneath each of these people so they can listen to them. So if you want to use the audio within the classroom as well, you can do that. So that's two ways of getting audio uh, for students to use in, in the classroom together, remote classroom together, or in a breakout room together. And now we've got just a click, a live button that they can click to get their instructions. How do you respond to the examples given? What effects does the speaker's tone of voice have? Okay, so that's your task. Uh, for discussion there that you can just open and the, the audio is all here on um, these ones the QR codes is based on H5P and these ones are embedded into the Genially so that's a, a quick way that you can make listening um, and you know breakout listening in breakout rooms possible just by getting students to scan those onto their phones. Um, this, there's a question about the quality of the sound. The quality of the sound depends on, you know, a, a number of issues. Um, it depends on your original source of your audio. You'll never get better quality sound than the, if, you, if you have your original sources in good quality. But it, it, on, the, on the QR codes, if scan, students scan the QR codes, the audio quality should be the same as the original. When you're working in the remote classroom, it's a bit more complex because the audio comes through Zoom and through the computer, and that can downgrade the quality of the audio a bit and make it more difficult to listen to. And that's one of the advantages of actually getting them to scan it onto their phone and listen there, I think. You know. But that's sort of quite easy to do. And
this is a another a, another of the listening activities that I've created for my own materials. And again, you know, the slides genially, but the audio, the, the activities are H5P. And so I've got my audio embedded in, in this one. But I've also, as an alternative to get around those problems, I've also got a QR code there, or I can play it directly from here as well. And this one has a, a link as well. So if students aren't, aren't getting that, well, for some reason my link isn't working. <laughs> Um, they can also click the link and uh, listen to the audio there. I need to fix that one. Come on. So there's an audio link too. The other thing that you can do in, in, in H5P is build in um, these sort of language uh, focused activities. So for this activity, I wanted to prepare some students with some vocabulary. So I've built this in, in H5P and it's just a drag and drop activity matching uh, task. and I have to drag the correct words into the boxes. When I get to the end of it, I can check it. And if I've got it wrong, I can either retry or it will show the solution there. And that was a, that's a simple drag and drop language activity built with H5P. So that's a way, way of preparing students with the materials before they get into the classroom. And again, I can show it that way or, or I've got the QR code. Students can scan it with their phone onto their phone and do the activity on their phone if they want to. So that's a, two different options for making that possible. One of the things that I like to do quite a lot, which I didn't notice in your materials, was dictation activities. And this is a kind of follow-up activity to that listening. And again, again, I've built it with a QR code so that students can scan it onto their phone if they want to, or, they can, or we can listen to it together here. And what I've got is I've got broken down the audio file into shorter sentences. So students can listen to the audio. Type in, and then once they've typed all of those in, I'll put that in all of them just to see. They can check their answers there. And they, I see I've got 13 out of 100. And then they can retry and do it again. You can configure it so that it also shows them the answer. But that's a way of giving them some quite intense listening practice to develop their sort of pronunciation. And that's quite a useful activity, I think, for, for developing students. And again, you can embed this into a Genially slide so that they do it in the remote classroom together, or they can scan it and do it on their phone and it can track into your LMS, whether you do it in breakout rooms, whether they do it at home alone, or whether they do it together in the remote classroom, all of that can be tracked. With discussion activities, you know, I've tried to sort of build these around adding information. So this was built around, this task was discussion activity built built around the image to get students interested. And then if they click on the interactive button, it opens up an infographic. And the infographic has sort of more information about mobile phone recycling and things like that. The infographic is copyright property, but I haven't taken it from the copyright owner. I've just embedded it into this, into this uh, slide button. So I haven't broke breached any copyright issues. It's still online at its original source. I've just made it easily accessible to my students. And that's, you know, having the infographic there is a, is a great way to add sort of dense information to the slide and make it, and make it accessible for them. Um, one of the other things that I do quite a lot with my materials is, is getting students to role play things in breakout rooms. And again, one of the frequent play, one of the frequent problems with doing role plays is, you know, I want my students to have role play cards so they know what their role is. But when they get into the breakout rooms, nothing is visible. So what I've done is I've put the role cards onto QR codes and they can scan these into their phone. 
And this is what it looks like. They've got a roll card. It tells them you're a manager. They click on it. It turns over and it gives them more information about their role. So that's roll card one. Student one scans that. They've got it onto their phone. Student two scans this one. You're a consultant. And that gives them information about their role. So those are just linked by QR codes and uh, embedded into Genially from H5P. And that makes, so once they've got those onto their phones, once we put them into the breakout rooms, they've still got the information that they need to do the role play that hasn't just disappeared. There are a few other examples of, of different activities that I've built with it here, which can be used either in, in the asynchronous classroom or the synchronous classroom. Um, again, these are built with H5P. This is a simple you know, gap filling activity. They've got a text about a film and they listen to the audio. And they just type in the answers, they type in the words that they hear. And these are quite simple to create using H5, H5P. All you need is the text and just to identify which words you want to have gapped. They can check it, retry it, or they can check again and it will show them the solution. Oh, I have to fill in more blanks first. But again, you know, that's something that students can do at home, building their, developing their comprehension skills, listening skills based around the sort of text that they can use, then use in the classroom. Another useful one is structured writing. And again, this is an activity that, that can be embedded into the LMS, or they can scan it onto their phone, or they can do it on their laptop. This one is about a film review, and what I've done is I've set up a, a group of questions for students to, to do this writing activity. So they type their answers about the film that they've watched into each of the sections. And then when they get to the end, they click on this one, and it creates a document for them. Then they can download that as a Word document, or they can click on Submit, if they're within an LMS or they can copy paste it and submit it to their teacher for marking. So this is a great way of, you know, getting them to work on written text that's structured in a specific way and built in a specific way and that they can submit it to you for marking through the LMS. And that's quite, again, that's quite easy to do. You know, you just decide on what, what parts of the text you want them to build, and then they, they respond to your prompts. But of course, that does have to be human marked. And that, of course, that takes time, especially if you've got 30 students, as I'm sure you know. Uh, H5P does offer an alternative solution for, for writing activities that's based around evaluating their use of Lexis. And this is an example activity. In this one, I've put in an image that students then have to write a description of. This doesn't have to be an image. It could be an infographic or something like that, that they had, to, or, or a chart with information in that they had to summarize. And what they do is they write a description. In this case, they write a description of what they see. I'm not gonna write one. I'm just gonna grab this text to use as an example. copy in there. And so once they've written their text and their description, they click on check. And what happens is they get a mark here. Their text is evaluated by the computer and they get a mark. In this case, it's out of 400. Now, in this case, what's being marked by the computer is their use of Lexis. It's not marking their grammar or sentence structure. It's, use, it's marking the quality of the Lexis that they use within, within the text. And what I've done is I've put in key words that I want them to, to, write, to use within describing that text, that, that image. So for example, surfboard, chair, calendar, wooden floor. And I've put in all those different keywords they could use and given them a score. So if they use more complex words, they'll get a higher score. If they use just simple basic words, then they won't score as much. And of course, they get no marks for using words that aren't part of my Lexis. And uh, so what the computer does, it tries to identify those words, whether they've used them and give them a score based around that. And then they can get their score, they can retry, or if they click, click, 
click on show, show solution, it will give them an example solution. So if they've written this solution, just copy that and retry it again. So if they've written my model solution, you know, what they should have got was 400 up from 400 because they've used good complex words and all the Lexis that I want from that. So when building an activity like this, I, I build my ideal answer first and then pull out the different Lexis from it and give and put those in into the computer so that the computer can spot those and I grade them and give them a score. And so it's, as I said, it has its limitations. It's not checking their grammar or their sentence structure, but it's a good way to get students writing and get their, and get their, them, them some feedback and some marking without you having to do loads and loads of marking. Yeah, there's a question about what's the score based on. The score is based on the words that they used. It's based on a, a group of keywords that I've programmed in. So I've chosen the keywords from my text, given them a score, each word a score for, you, for using that word. And then if they use them, that, adds, that builds up their score here. Um, another useful activity this one's based around a video and this is reading and summarizing this this could be an audio or, or it could be a video and students watch the video um, this one's about uh, a muslim girl who became a world champion kickboxer and as they watch they have to be build the summary from the, the choice of sentences they have underneath and if I get the wrong one, I have to choose a different one. And again, it's marking me all the time. So I've got four wrong answers so far and two out of nine in my progress. And of course, all of this can be, um, all of this can be tracked within your LMS. So you know whether your students are watching the video and you know how well they're scoring. And again, you know, you could give it to them to do in a remote classroom, but probably something better for them to do um, or asynchronously at home. And then they can use the, the time in class to kind of discuss the content. Other useful but quite easy things, useful things, the, the, you can build flat vocabulary flashcards. You type in your answer and check it. And uh, at the end, you can find out which ones you've got right or wrong. Very simple to build if you've got images. Uh, word grammar, again, you know, these are descriptions of, of, and students have to get the words into the correct order. So if you're looking for something more about building grammar or word grammar, um, those, th these kinds of activities can be much easier or, or much more useful. Yes, it wasn't specifically built for um, language learning. Uh, it, the, the tool H5P was actually built by the Norwegian Army for, for training soldiers to, in various things, language learning included, and they built it and made it open source, and now they've made it available for anyone to use. It was originally just a plugin for Moodle or WordPress, but now you can get an, uh, a, a, an API and plug it into just about any good um, learning platform. One of the last things that I'll show you, which is quite interesting, I'll have to switch to Chrome to do this. So you'll have to, because this is something that only works in Chrome, but it's a way of um, checking students, getting students uh, to practice their speaking and pronunciation. Can you see on your screen, it says pronunciation check. Have you got that there? I've lost the chat. Could you type a yes if you can see it? Yeah, great. So this is an example of a, a speaking activity that I've built and it's based around pronunciation. And um, if, if they start the course, what they do is they click on the button, they have a sentence here that they have to record and they click on the button and the student, the computer will listen to them and evaluate them. Location is very important to me and I would really like to live close to the sea. Okay, I've got a star for that. Well done, I've got it right. Okay. If I look at the next one, I'll get the next one wrong. I want my house have loads light. Okay, I've got that one wrong, so I need to retry it. 
I want my house loads light have. Again, it's wrong. If I click on show the solution, I get shown what I should have said, but I also get shown what the computer heard as well. So I get some feedback on my speaking. Um, I think, you know, it's a really useful activity to get students working autonomously on their speaking, to drill them and working on their pronunciation. When you program in this activity, you can choose what accent you want them to aim for. So there are a range of different accents to choose from. So you could choose an American English or a British English, Australian English, or different regional variations of English that you wanted them to aim for too. So when you give them the example sentence, you also, you know, and you configure the activity, you also choose what accent you want them to aim for. It can be quite difficult. And I've got some of the British English ones wrong. So make students aware of that, you know, so that they don't feel that they're doing really badly. But it is a, is a way to get students practicing their pronunciation, uh, working with, with speaking without having to be in the classroom. And that can that save classroom time so that we're using it for more, you know, more creative, more interactive, more critical thinking types of activities. As I said, the one problem with it, though, is that it will only work in Google Chrome. I'm not sure whether, it, but because of that, I'm not sure whether it will work in China or not. I can't be sure of that. Okay, I'll just find my screen again. Can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the quality of the sound, as you said, that the quality of the sound, would it be better if the students are using the QR code to listen from their mobile phone rather than play it from the computer? Yes, it would be. If, it they're, would be. if they're pulling it onto their QR phone code, on their on their mobile from the QR code, it should be much better quality. Because the quality of the audio from the computer varies depending on what platform you're using. Mm -hmm. In some platforms, it's much better than in others. Zoom, it's a bit kind of variable, but because it's going through a number of platforms, that would the quality of the sound. So definitely, yeah, it's that's right. Much better. Okay, okay. Thank it's you. coming through the same channel that my speaking is coming from. So there's sort of problems there with that you know right. but you know it, it is an alternative if you need to do it but you could also they could either have a qr code and get it mm. or you could give them a link to it and share a link through the chat so that they had it in through the chat room and then it would be very good quality sound right right thank you so different alternatives uh, i'll just move on in terms of the qr codes i don't know if you uh, if you have uh, practice at creating QR codes. Um, this is a very uh, simple tool to use to create a QR code with. You just grab any URL. You go to a site called the QR code generator. Here at the top where it says URL, you click on there and enter your URL. Okay, that's my code and that's generated my code there. If you can see, I, if I take that out, the code changes again. If I put it in, there's the code. Now, if I click on save and give that a name, that will save that QR code to my computer. There it is over there. Okay. And then I can add that QR code image to any of my materials. There it is. There, full screen. That's a bit small. Okay, it's not going to cooperate. Okay, so that's a, a very easy, quick way of creating QR codes. And then, of course, the students, as soon as students scan that QR code, they've got whatever that links to um, onto their mobile device. Uh, for example, if you were to scan that one now, you would have a link to my interactive presentation there. And I'll give you a link to that at the end. So again, you know, very easy, easy to use, free to use QR code scanner. Click on URL, type in your, type in your URL, and and uh, just save it, and students can scan it.
Something else that you might find useful again is is um, to have some image resources. You know, these are the first two, Unsplash and Pixabay. Those are, are links to um, sites that have royalty free images. So you're free to use any images you find on those, download them and add, add them to your materials without having to give credit to, for them or pay royalties on them. And I, I find that, you know, especially in the remote classroom, having access to lots of different images can be really, uh, and to, to, to be able to use those within your materials can be really beneficial. You know, and there are millions and millions of different ones in there, which you can just download and add for free. They're free to download at different resolutions as well. So that's, uh, Pixabay is, is, that one is quite, uh, has quite kind of stock photographs. If you want something more artistic, uh, Unsplash ha tends to have sort of a more artistic collection of images um, that you can download. Again, I'll go for China. Yeah. And you just choose the images that you want and uh, you can choose orientation, whether you want them landscape or portrait. Those are all portrait now and download whatever you want. And again, you know, if you want to acknowledge the source, you can, but you don't have to. One other thing that I find really useful to start embedding into to materials is, is video. And here on this site called Mixkit, you can download royalty free audio and video that again, you can use in any of your, your creative materials for your, for your, um, to make it them more interactive. And then most of them are these just silent clips of, of different scenes. Again, this is a... And you can download these and then embed them into your remote materials. And they can, they can make the materials sort of that much more engaging uh, for students and generate that much more discussion about them. Again, if I go, I'll do a search on China. See if there's anything in. Yeah. Okay, so different scenes from China. Okay, and you can embed these very easily into um, the Genially presentation that I'm using now. You just download them and store them on your own platform to use them. That's mixed kit. The other thing that I think is really useful, uh, especially for sort of quite dense uh, reading activities and the kinds of materials that you're creating, you know, that are very data heavy, is things like infographics. You, and you can use Genially to create those, but you can also share, uh, search for them on online and see if you can find something useful to use in your infographics. And if you go to Google Images, you can usually find lots of different um, infographics about different things. If I search infographics, China, you know, it produces lots of different infographics about China. And you know, all I need to do is, is, is then link to those through my, get the, get the link. And then I can sort of add a link to those through my Genially presentation and they will open on the presentation and I can build materials around those. In fact, one of the first series of lesson plans that I wrote, um, the, my, the lessons in digital, digital um, literacy that I wrote was all, all based around different infographics that I found online and I sort of built them into these materials. So, you know, infographics can make dense information, much more accessible, much more engaging, much more interesting, and a lot more screen friendly as well. So sort of have a think about whether you can find an infographic that has the information you need in. Just quickly, a couple of useful tools for students. Um, this, this one, or oh, this could be useful for you or for, for students. If you just want to create an instant page that you take notes in, um, this is something called Telegraph. And if you click on it, it opens up and uh, there you'll see at the top there, you just add a title. And I can start taking notes on my lesson today. 
I can also add images or video if I want to, to, to my notes. And as soon as I've finished, I click on publish and I get a, a hyperlink that's put that online and then I can share that um, with, with my teacher. So that's a sort of easy way to, to get students taking notes that they can then go back and edit and sharing them with other students in the class or sharing them with the teacher. So that if you're, if you're running a remote class, you know, you're running a remote lesson and your students are taking notes about the things that they're learning and you want to see them, then they can take notes there and share that with you. And that's something simple called Telegraph. I'll just share the, the link with that to you and you can try it now. Okay, that's Telegraph. And you just open it up, put the title in, your name, start typing your notes. And then when you're finished, you click edit and it generates a URL. Okay, I'll show you one last thing before we go to the Q&A, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. Um, this is a, something that you can use with your students to get them recording audio, recording voice and sharing it with you very easily. Or you could use it yourself to share um, examples of, of short clips uh, with them too. It's something called Vakaroo. Again, it, it works within the browser and you just click on the record button allow your microphone and then you start talking and it will record exactly what you're saying click stop and then you can play that back and then if you're ha they're happy with it they can either re-record re or click on save and share and this gives them a, a link to it that they can share um, within chat within the remote classroom Or they can get a QR code so that someone else can scan it. Or they can embed it or download the audio to share later. But that's a great way of getting your students to do speaking activities that then you can listen to later. So you get those links, you can listen to it later, check their speaking, check their pronunciation, even reply to them using the same method. And that can be either be used within the remote classroom or used asynchronously for homework or within a platform. Or you can use it to create your own audio. And that's a very useful, easy tool to use. It will also work on a mobile device as well. It should work on a, a Google or an Android phone as well. So a great way of, of getting students to create audio, do speaking activities and making it very easy to share. They've only got to share that link there. They haven't got to upload and download the audio file or move up audio files around as attachments. So that kind of makes life a bit easier. Okay. So that's a, a lot of talking from me and a lot of listening from you. So um, let's go to the any questions stage. If you scan the QR code into your phone here, you, you'll get a question sheet that looks like this and you can click to ask a question and type your question in here and then click on submit. If you haven't got a QR code scanner, I'll put the, the link to it into here. So if you want to ask questions that way, there's a link in chat now and you can click and, and uh, ask the questions there. And um, what we'll see is all the questions should appear here once they've, once they've been asked. This is a, call to, a tool called Mentimeter and it allows you to create these kind of polls and interactions which can be embedded into Genially and then they'll show questions and answers. So if anybody wants to use that to ask a question, then the, those should start appearing here soon. I'll give you some time to think about questions and I'll grab some water and then I'll come back. Okay.
Okay, I'll start dealing with some of the questions. The, the first question is, it, is it better to teach standing up or sitting down? For me, absolutely, definitely standing up, you know, um, for a number of reasons. I always do these sessions standing up. Um, it allows me to move around. I can change the distance I have between the camera and the, and the screen. So if I want to move back, most of the time, if I move back, I, I can use body language when I'm talking. Um, use gestures and things like that. If I want students' attention, I can sort of wave, come up close and wave my finger at them and tell them to listen to me. Um, and it makes it much more dynamic. It's also much healthier if you teach standing up. And, um, you know, because sitting at the desk is like smoking, you know, it's really bad for your health. So, that, you know, if you're doing this all day and you're just sitting at a desk the whole day, it's, it's just not good for your health. So standing, you can be much more dynamic. You can move around a lot. Um, I actually use, I'll show you this, I use, um, I have two of these, which are Bluetooth earpieces. Um, it's called Jabra. And so they have my microphone uh, attached to them. There's a microphone on each one and speakers. And because they're wireless, I can move around as much as I want. And I don't have to worry about sort of pulling the, the, the microphone out from the computer. But the sound should stay the same. You know, if you're using the built-in microphone from your computer, the sound isn't so good. And if you start moving around, the sound varies. But with these, I can move as much as I want to, and uh, and I can still be hit, heard equally well or equally badly. So yeah, for me, the, the the answer is always teach standing up. You know, I I I became a teacher because I didn't want to have a desk job. So you know, I don't want to <laughs> sit at a desk now. What's the best way to have students write something on a PDF online? Um, I don't know. You can have uh, have editable PDFs. You know, I'm not absolutely sure why why you would want to have somebody write something on a PDF online. I think you know the best thing would be to to convert it um, to to something that's editable, uh, whether it's a Word document or something like that that they can add comments to. You know, if you can use, I don't know if you can use Google Apps or Google Docs with your students, but you can add comments to those. Even with uh, Word online now, you can add comments to those. But it's, uh, you know, that can really sort of help um, with the with the kind of, you know, it, it, it making it more interactive. I wouldn't use a PDF uh, for teaching online, really. Um, there's a question about the earphones. The, the kind of earphones I, I use are called Jabra Elite 65. That's the ones I use. They're by a company called Drab Jabra, and it's a model Elite 65. And I found they're very useful. They're also really much more comfortable than using uh, the big headphones, because especially for my ears, because they stick out. You know, if you're using headphones all day, then it, it, your ears get really hot and it becomes really uncomfortable. have any tips on mixed mode teaching running face-to-face -face teaching and zoom lessons at the same time can be yeah this is for me this is a, a a big question that that a lot of people are asking at the moment and personally i think this is something we should avoid if we possibly can you know i think if we're teaching a class in the physical classroom at the same time that we're teaching a class in the remote classroom we can't possibly give those students the best quality customer experience you know the students in the physical classroom will suffer because half of your attention is with these other people and the people in the, the online classroom will suffer as well because you know you're actually teaching someone who's in a physical classroom not those so if you can try to avoid this do you know and the way to avoid this is to sort of think about your courses and how much of that content can be moved into asynchronous learning that's on a, on an lms and can be tracked you know if you pull out all of the bits like reading activities and things that that have a, a fixed answer and put them onto a onto a platform so that students can do them they can still have their course time still get through all the goals and you can separate so that you you have your physical students in the physical classroom and give them a hundred percent the best customer experience you can and you do the same for your remote classroom students you know, but don't try and do them at the same time. You're really sort of underselling everybody that way, I think. 
If you're teaching multiple sections of a course, can the same presentation be used for each one or do, do you need to create multiple versions with duplicated shared materials? Uh, in the case of crypt docs, you'd have to duplicate the materials because you're creating one version and it's being edited. What you could do is have your own version of the text and get students to copy paste that so they create their own version and work with that. Um, I think that's that's what you mean, um, if that's a question about CryptPad. Um, in the case of the Genially presentations, you can use those over and over as many times as you like. But if we're talking about that sort of collaborative uh, writing activity, you'd need to give them the students the text and they create their version within CryptPad and share it together so that it's not they're not overwriting somebody else's. Uh, yeah, Genially is much more flexible than PowerPoint. It's also great because, you know, it's all stored online. Uh, you can go back and change it. It's much more dynamic. It can become quicker to work with, and you can sort of build in all these buttons and interactions, embedded things. So for me, it's much more, more flexible and much more useful. What I usually, what I started doing is I upload my PowerPoint presentations now and convert them to Genially and build in the interaction. So you can make it much more interactive. Does Microsoft have a product that functions like Google Slides? Um, I don't know if PowerPoint is now, I think Microsoft might have a PowerPoint version that's online now. Um, you can also try the slides in CryptPad, they might work, but Genially should also work and do and function in a similar way to Google Slides. But I'm, I'm not a big authority on Microsoft. I try to avoid their products whenever I can. Uh, my computer sta set up for teaching standing. Uh, I don't know how, I, uh, hang on, I'll, t I'll take a photograph and see if I can uh, send it to you. What I have is when I teach standing up is I have a platform that goes on my desk and the platform can go up and down so I can elevate it and rise it and fall it. So when I'm sitting down, it's down. And then I pull on some clamps at the side and it rises up. Um, it wasn't particularly expensive to do, um, to get, but it's been very useful. Just let me shift this to my computer and I'll see if I can share it with you. You'll see how messy my room is down now. Okay, can you see the picture? Yeah, that, that's that's basically what my stand-up desk looks like. There's my there are you on on the computer screen there, and there's a, a the, this black thing, this platform. I can squeeze the clamps at the side, which are just below below my um, image of Ganesh, and it goes down, or I can make it go up again. You know, so, so from here, you see that I'm looking incredibly tidy and organized. And then from the other side of the room, you can see that it's incredibly messy and disorganized. But uh, so you've seen enough of that now. So I've got my plain blank wall that's distraction free behind me. And, and on the other side of the screen is total chaos. But, you know, here I've got enough space to move around and, um, no, and as I said, it, it makes me feel more dynamic when I'm delivering the presentations and I can be more engaging and I can use this space and hand gestures and things like that. Uh, the wireless microphones are called Jabra. Um, I'll just see if I can send a link to that. Through. I'm sure there are other ones, and if you if you have a, an iPhone or something like that, you might have wireless ones that you can use with your computer. But these are called, oh, sorry, that should be Jabra, not Sabra. Jabra is a common brand. Um, they, they, they produce lots of things for sort of video conferencing, and um, it's, they're very useful and very comfortable, and they, they sort of recharge themselves, and I can use them for about five hours without having to recharge them. 
Okay, well, that, that's all the questions from my presentation. I've got a few links, a more, few more links that I can share with you. Oh, sorry, there's another question popped up now. Let's go back to that. How many gigabytes of RAM would you recommend having? Um, I don't know that, you know, I don't know that that's a problem usually. Um, most modern computers, if you've got a modern computer, it should be sufficient for doing this kind of stuff. You know, none of the stuff that I, I, I do requires high kind of high spec computers. I mean, I, I use a Mac because it's got a big screen and I have bad eyesight. So, you know, it's just useful. Um, there's a few things that I do here that you can check up on when you get the presentation. I, I manage a site called T Tools for Teachers and Learners, which looks like this. And it's where I curate and collect different useful tools for, for teaching with. There are about 1,500 different tools there. If you go through and check those out, um, lots of different things that can help you with remote teaching and learning. Also publish an EdTech newsletter, which you can subscribe to. It's once a month um, and I share new things that I found. I have a blog. There's a link to my publications and a link to Twitter there. So if you want to find out more about these kind of tools and the things that I do, um, once you get the presentation, check that out. Um, if you'd like a, co a free copy of one of my books, I've published a book called Digital Tools for Teachers, which is here. Um, I'll share the link with you through chat. Um, so, sorry, if you grab this, code here where it says R98UIQIGL6. And if you take that code and go to the site, click on buy now, put in your name and email address and where it says add coupon code, if you click there, you can add the coupon code and you'll get the, the it will reduce the price of the book to zero. So you, if you want a co free copy of that book, it's quite an old book now, but if you want a free copy, just click on there click on buy now, add your email de details and use this coupon code and that will reduce the price to zero and you can have a free copy. And that's got about 70 different tools in and they're reviewed. Um, lastly, thank you for listening. If you want the presentation or a link to the presentation, you can either scan the QR code or I'll share the presentation now through the chat. Okay, there's the presentation link is in chat in the chat now. So if you just click on it, it will open in your browser and that will be completely interactive just as you've seen it. So it has links through to all the examples and uh, everything that I've shown you. So that's was a bit of a rush, but I've still got two minutes to spare. So thank you and uh, thanks for listening and I hope that's been useful. Okay, thank you, Nick, for a very rewarding one and a half hour with us and being very generous sharing with us the online resources. Uh, make sure you save the link and, uh, and the password and the code because um, you, know, you won't be able to achieve that from, from chat afterwards. Yeah, get the link to the presentation and you'll be able to go through everything and find everything there later. And I'll share the, the presentation with you as well so you can share it with everybody if you want to store it. Okay. You can, I can also give you an embed code for it so that you can embed it on the site if you want to when the recording is available. So that's fine. It's no problem. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. And uh, there's the feedback form that we put in the chat. So please uh, help us to um, give us some feedback. And we have our next session in October, right? So uh, we will send out information um, next week. Okay, so thank you very much, all our colleagues. And thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Give him a virtual round. Enjoy. Enjoy your remote teaching and uh, and I hope everything goes well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank, you Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.